I'm very pleased today to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Sabine Martin and uh, Dr. Uh, Uli Meyer, uh, both who are visiting us from the Munich Center for Technology in Society. Um, we are um, obviously their interests uh, are very much aligned with things that we are doing here at NTU, um, especially in our new NTU Institute of Science and Technology uh, for Humanity. Uh, so we're very much interested in hearing more about their uh, institute okay. and the kinds of work that they're doing. Um, and I'll hand it over to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sabine Masen. Thank you so much for being here, for inviting us. It was really kind of you to make it possible. We were just here for a few days and did some things like interviews and summer schools, and now we're happy to introduce ourselves to you. Of course, we consider you our fellow institute in the making. Actually, we consider ourselves as an institute in the making. STS is always not changing, ever-changing thing. So. Um, Let's try to understand each other, what we are doing, what we're heading for, and try to find out whether we could, in the near future, collaborate. There are already some things going on, but there could be more, of course, because I think what we share is a feeling that of, although the community is growing and the, the need and the, the perceived need of having some kind of SDRS around is growing, we have not that many people, not that many institutions around, and we should join forces in order to get we going. And I think it's already also very important to do it in a transnational fashion, not just no, national-wise, nation-wise. Okay, so this is what we can offer today. We just try to explain who we are, what we are, what we're heading for, give some examples of it, only two or three, not much and then try to you know, come into a conversation with you and try to find out whether we are indeed as aligned as just announced, <laughs> whether we, where our differences are, where we are complementary or whatever. Okay, so the thing is called Munich Center for Technology in Society, a slightly different naming as you have as NIST. Um, the idea was but exactly the same, I think. No, the president of our university, the Technical University of Munich, thought there's more no, to these grand pro projects uh, than engineering and science. There is some society around it, and we should somehow address it. So, and this is actually what we, no, it's kind of our mission put into the title, understanding and shaping science, technology, and society in a techno-social world. Of course, I know we all use one or other term, so it's not very original. We don't need to be original here. It's our mission, and that's important, not just do research, not just do teaching, which we do as well, but also try to get involved in one way or the other, shape or co-shape science, technology, and society. And what we would like to do is to briefly introduce ourselves and then uh, go on. Actually, again, my thing is not coming up. Okay. Um, actually, the next slide is excluded. Here is it. Okay, that's me. <laughs> Okay, you have my name already, Sabine Masen. I'm the director currently of MCTS. I have a chair in sociology of science. At my chair, we are all interested in the complex entanglements of technology and something else. We've, recently, we focused on techno natures in certain kinds of foods. We uh, try to find out how nature and technology are deeply entangled from all over the life cycle, from the breeding to the con consumption. We do have techno-natural techno relationships. Then we're introduced in robotics. I will um, elaborate on that a bit later. Then we are interested in the new way of doing a university today, particularly a technical universities, getting entrepreneurial, excellent, and involved, and responsible. And then we're in, uh, interested in so-called techno-publics, notably in the uh, arrangement of citizen science. What is citizen science actually about? And do empirical research on citizen science. We, just, we do citizen science and research citizen science. 
my personal topics within this group are you know, is, uh, related to the theology of the neurosciences, into the socio-technical arrangements of cells and society, post-social conditions, and uh, particularly I have history in collaborative scientific practices in researching how they go interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, collaborative, whatever. And here comes next my colleague at MCTS, that's Uli Meyer. <laughs> um, I, will, I will talk about our work later on, so let me be brief here. I'm head of the um, uh, research group Reorganizing Industries. We just briefly talked about this. We called it lab because this is, makes it understandable to our friends in engineering and the natural sciences, but it's actually a research group. And we focus on the interplay between science, technology, and different kind of organizations. So industry is one focus. I will talk about industry, this idea of an industry 4.0 later on, but, but also all other, other kind of, of relations, starting with this idea that a lot of the topics we are interested in in science and technology studies mm -hmm. um, happen within organizations or are influenced or even triggered by organizations like state agencies or people. Comments. I will talk about this. Thank you. So I go on with briefly telling you what we wanted to tell you next. After a brief introduction, I would uh, go briefly into MCTS, the basic idea and its mission, so that you have an idea who we are. I will not go into the basic idea of STS, science and technology studies, but rather into our idea and our approach. But I'm looking forward to broad discussions <laughs> over SDS as well and later on. And then we would like to give you a brief tour through our field of activity by way of examples. This uh, Uli Meyer will talk about Industry 4.0 and I will talk about social robotics. And thereafter, just briefly about our third mission, that, uh, second mission that's teaching, uh, so just to let you know what we do here. And uh, finally, about what next, what we, are we uh, striving for, the next thing will be excellence and responsible engineering. Okay, so I think the, um, the context is not at all new to you, so I can be brief here as well. In Europe, notably, we talk about all these grand challenges which we are confronted with right now. Of course, you know them, education, energy, environment, food, health, whatever. We need to address them specifically. It's not about just hmm, a particular issue, but these are types of problems that concern the socioeconomic system as a whole, even inducing or even requiring system transformation. It's really big, it's really asking for collaborative responses. And this orientation to such a kind of a problem, such a problem type named when challenges creates a challenge for science as well, for science, technology, and innovation. We can't, just can't do it the same way as we did before. That's implied in this very idea. So we need a concerted action, and we need adaptive research policies you know, that are able to guide us here and to uh, incentivize such kind of research. Examples from Germany would be such kind of high-tech strategy or our future projects. They are you know, very broadly defined so as to allow for very specific sub-projects to be uh, done under this heading and to actually you know, coordinate many different actors involved, not just scientific, not just engineers, but also governmental, non-governmental, what have you, uh, but mostly with the leading role of the government. And yet another challenge implied in grand challenges is you know, how to modulate research in, in innovation so that grand challenges can be addressed properly. How should science and technology be done? How should innovation be done? And I think at this point, technical universities assume a very special role, an essential role, in addressing these grand challenges because, and that's a nice quote, I think, by Foray, they address a number of strategic issues cutting across their principal missions and of educating, performing research, increasing access to knowledge, and providing independent ex expertise to society. So this is a number of missions entangled and uh, implied in this uh, kind of science and engineering we should do and innovation. And within this, 
There is a special role for the social sciences and the humanities. And again, a nice quote by Thoreau, I think, it's not no, that the social sciences and humanities help the scientists and the business to reduce public resistance. It's not just about acceptance research, by far not. No, the social scientists and the humanities are a central part of the knowledge required to address grand challenges. They come into play as an independent but yet collaborative partner of the knowledge that's required to address social science, uh, um, grand challenges. And this is uh, the background for MCTS. I think similar narratives could be told for you, so that's pretty uh, much the same. And of course, when we talk about understanding and shaping techno society, we mean no, we deal with the manifold interactions of science, technology, and society. This is very broad and umbrella. I know this. We can, I get a bit more specific on the next slide. Question is first, who are we? Basically speaking, we, the people at MCTS, are people from the humanities and from the social sciences. And we try to combine our expertise with knowledge from the natural sciences and engineering. More often than not, people at MCTS come with two kinds of education. There are social scientists and physis physicists, or they have a biomedical training as well, or they have a long-standing expertise in researching these areas. So they are pretty good at you know, linking up with um, um, natural scientific and engineering types of expertise. Here's who we are. It's not the latest transparency, uh, but here we have sociology of science, it's me, philosophy and history, the, the three basic pillars of SDS, if you say so. Then we have <coughs> participatory technology design. That will be you know, another person very soon because unfortunately, Ignacio Faria has left us, but it's all about public engagement in science and technology. Then there we have science and technology policy. That's Ruth Müller. Her domain is the um, biotechnical life sciences area. And then we have innovation research by Sebastian Furtenhauer. He does all about no, uh, innovation narratives uh, all around. Um, then we have two what we call labs. Uh, the idea of the lab has already been explained a bit. Uh, that are postdoctoral research groups in a way, uh, one on digital media and one on reorganizing industry. And the last one is a lab we have created cutting through all of MCTS. So uh, uh, every uh, group has one or two people in it, and we all try to do something about responsible issues on certain topics. And this is what unites us in this very uh, lab. Okay? So we have. Currently, we have uh, five people, three still in the making, and a joint lab, right? Plus a bunch of doctoral students, about 40 at present. Now, as we all share this idea, I think it doesn't need to be spelled out very largely, but we just don't only think about techno society, but we do actually hard nosed <laughs> empirical research guided by all type, types of methods and theories that you can have in the social science and humanities. We try to be interdisciplinary both among us, so transcending the individual research groups, but also you know, collaborating with others. Always reflexive what kind of society, what kind of organizations do we work in? No, we just no, don't. Want to know, we just want to know what actually comes out of it, all of, of these uh, interactions. And a major part of virtually every project is to be, you know, have a dialogic part in it, hmm. to be you know, somehow engaging in public engagement or be, be it elaborate, uh, collaborative from its nature. Again, the mission talk here is let's talk about engineering society together. Of course, a philosopher would say, well, engineering society, what does that mean? But, uh, it's kind of a, no, um, an effort to say, let's we all actually work on society every day, whichever discipline we come from, let's be you know, true about that and uh, let's talk together uh, about how we can shape it. Okay, as I already said, our disciplinary field, we are united by some relation or the other to science and technology studies, yet in actual fact, 
virtually everyone comes from a different field. The, both, the two of us, we come from sociology. I have also a psychology, psychology background. Others come from biology or whatever. Uh, some from the histor um, historical sciences or whatever, philosophy. So, but we all have a strong uh, inclination with science and technology studies. Uh, yet, it's my goal that we, c we, we have different ideas of what SDS is. We don't have to be united on one, one type of SDS. So there are different uh, readings uh, around. But what we are united in is that we all do empirical studies on science, and, uh, on science and technology as they shape and as they are shaped by their social, their political, their economic, their cultural context, and what have you. And this shaping and shaped by is absolutely mandatory that it goes as a two-way street, and it's always empirical. Uh, of course, SDS, as you know, draws on many fields from the social sciences and humanities, also from a range of concepts, theories, methods, and so do we. And when we read you know, science and technology studies, we say science can be different sciences, different, different, uh, different disciplines, computer sciences or the life sciences. Technology, here people deal with, say, digital technologies or um, biotechnologies. When it comes to society, things are yet so big variety. You, they may deal with individuals or groups or politics or economy or organizations as uh, Ulimaya does or public discourses as others do. So it's really a big variety of what society is, so what do we mean by society in each empirical study. And Finally, we are generally, all of us, we are interested in transformative processes, uh, such as, for instance, innovation path or something. Uh, for instance, we have um, problems dealing with genetic engineering. It raises questions as how to define and govern life. I think that's a joint interest here. Uh, we have projects on robots. Uh, I will detail that a bit later. It's all about assisted living. It changes spaces of domestic care. Then we have projects about big data and machine learning. Of course, they alter the ways in which we work, vote, consume. So all these transformative processes, this is, I think, that we are uh, united here, both at MCTS and maybe we share this interest as well. What is our specific approach? We had one guest uh, the other day named Antoine Aignan, and he was so nice as to put it this way, how can one engage in STS today if not collaboratively? And this question actually captures what we are actually uh, attuned to. Yes, collaboration defines a very specific mode of engaging in STS as an intellectual practice. It's not just disciplines, but it's also interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, engaging in one way or the other. It may be minimal, it may be uh, its very nature, whatever. And it's, of course, it's a type of STS that expands its theoretical insights, its analytical perspectives, and its empirical sensibilities way beyond science and technology to actively explore, to actually engage with a number of other people, objects, such as markets, such as government, such as employees, such as design, care, cities, what have you. These are the others, and not only the others, but we try to engage with them in one way or the other. A collaborative mode of practicing SDS is more or less committed to action type research projects based on, say, dialogue, on mutual learning, on some kind of engaged relationships with heterogeneous collectives more or less, but we try to do this whenever we do a project to somehow engage with other stakeholders. Okay, now after this hard part, we get into the nuts and bolts, two examples, one being from Oli's group, Industrie Fionol, and one other from my group on social robotics. The floor is open. Other than you want to have, want to raise some questions in between before we go on? Happy to answer any questions. Okay. If Should not, I take the, the mic? okay. Here we go. Um, yeah, I, I would like to tell you a little bit about like the work we do in the relation of digitalization and industries, or like as it often is called, 
um, um, industry for or industry 4.0 as it's called in German and I just want to give you an idea what this is supposed to be so we are, we are more or less on the same page and this is one quote from an from an association which is called Platform Industry 4.0, which is explicitly funded by state actors and industry associations and also labor unions to, to promote and enable Industry 4.0 in Germany. And, um, <clears throat> and it says, Industry 4.0 combines production methods with state-of-the-art information and communication technology. So this is, this is not a description of what happens, right? This is the... the, this is the grand narrative which is now em employed and this is this is our starting point and then, then we're trying to figure out what actually happened so just but this is the the narrative this is what people may refer to if they say industry 4.0 so and it's who said, who said this? so this is this is a quote by the platform industry 4.0 which is an in in meta organization so it has, has other organization as members such as industry associations um, uh, ministries, uh, but also um, labor unions. Um, and so, of course, the starting point is technical, right? So it starts with changing technology. And the driving force behind this development is the rapidly increasing digitization of the economy and society. It is changing the future of manufacturing and work in Germany. So it's a German campaign. In the tradition of the steam engine, the production line, electronics and IT smart factories are now determining the fourth industrial revolution. So besides, so, so technical change has impact on society. This is one part of the narrative. The other one, it's, it's in the line with all the big transformations of industry. And there's, there's always, you will find um, pictures like this, so, so we started with one, and um, hopefully all, all um, historians in the room now start laughing because it's probably not a proper description from a history perspective, but this is the grand narrative, right? And, and of course, the Industry 3.0, 2.0, and 1.0 have only been invented when they came up with the term Industry 4.0. But this is still our starting point. Um, and um, for, for our research, and, and this, this narrative is used to, to describe what is going to happen in the world. So there's one quote from Klaus Schwab, um, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, and he, he highlights the, the, the impact this will have on our world, and he says, uh, the, the, this transformation about Industry 4.0 will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. So this is like in this perspective, as big as it can get. And if you look at what, what, this, uh, what the Thilo Brotmann, the, the, the director of the German Engineering Association um, states, then you see that he highlights some of the, the challenges, right? So it, 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 it will be different in different regions. I mean, what does it mean if, um, if, if, if jobs are moved back to Europe and the United States, this probably has some impact on other regions. I mean, he doesn't mention that here, but this will probably have some impact on other regions. Um, it also, of course, in his perspective, will be good for the environment. It will help with growing world population, and it will impact the wor workforce uh, in the future. And, and as I said, this is the starting point. So, so what we are interested in, so what's the role of this narrative What's the impact of this narrative and, and what we can say or what I can just say beforehand is there is a lot of impact on this, by this or from this, but it's probably not what's described in the narrative itself. So what you would find is a lot of changes um, in very different areas, but probably not the changes described here. So not all factory in Germany by now is a smart factory, probably on the, on the contrary. And, so what we do, how do we do this? Um, as I earlier said, we always look at this relation between technology and society, very basic STS, of course, and then always try to bring different kind of organization into the mix and highlight that these are main arenas, but also actors in modern society and influencing this relation. And what we do is we, we work and collaborate with a lot of companies. And, and the, the important point is the second one, which is um, shared projects, different interests. So, so we don't do research for them. So it's not that we do R&D projects for companies. Um, 
but uh, and and we don't try to find common try to find common ground, but we just try to find setups which produce outputs which is relevant for the company, which is important because otherwise they wouldn't join the project. And um, and but it also has to produce um, outcomes which are interesting for us, which means scientific results. So so like we always try to include this heterogeneity within the project, and then we try to use, and I will briefly talk about this in the, on the next slide. We use different forms of engagement and use them, as, use them as social science methods. So of course we also do interviews, but they also only bring you so far, and then we just use all different kind of engagement to learn more about what's going on with this Industry 4.0 thing. And then, as I said, we, we, try, we produce results, which is nice for the company, because otherwise they would leave. But m more important for us is that we also produce um, outputs for science and technology studies. And this is some of the projects we are, we are working on. And one is uh, the dynamic of, of the narrative industry 4.0. So how did this idea come, become so powerful? Um, and what, does, what impact does it have? And this is something I will briefly talk about. I will go into details of two of these examples, and this is one of them. Then it's about digital competencies. We do research, again, joint projects with different kind of companies. But what does this mean for the people working in this company? So what kind of additional competencies do, do they need? Do they actually want to have them? And what could be ways to, to bring them along? So it, it doesn't help if... Um, if you have new technologies in the company and nobody can or doesn't want to use them. Um, one thing we do is, as, as one of these tools is makeathons. This is pictures from a makeathon. So this is about the new options which come uh, with additive manufacturing, 3D printing, and digital technologies when it comes to prosthesis. So this is artificial um, arms and limbs or legs. Uh, produced at one of these makeathons, so we brought together uh, people from 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 big companies, from small startups, from uh, producers of these machines. These are two 3D printers, uh, but also uh, patients and users of these prostheses. And we had them um, uh, sit uh, like not locked in, but closely. But we had them. We brought them together for a week. Um, and made them think about how will prosthesis and the process of making them and ad ad adapting them to the needs of, of the users look like in the future. So we did this in Munich, we did this in the USA, US, we did this in, in, in Canada. And so for them, again, this is a way to talk to each other, more often than not for the first time, but also to learn, for, for us to learn for, um, about this very, very distressing. Okay. Mm. We, like r r right now, or last month, like one of our PhDs did this in Haiti, mm -hmm. and this is this is this is crazy because there the technical features are not important at all. It really it's depending on that it looks like a human arm, and, and if you bring kid in, bring in kids, for example from the US, it couldn't be more different, right? So so there's the story about this little girl who just came up with the idea that she 
doesn't have a hand but a glitter cannon, so she can run around and shoot glitter at people. So, so there's very different ideas how prosthesis of the future look like. Um, uh, this is the second point I will talk a little bit more about after that. So the future of work. How, how can work look like in the future? And who do we want to involve to think about this? Like, is this somebody companies decide, or top management decide, or states decide, or, or who, who, who is, should decide about this? We look at um, innovation ecosystems. So if you have like, innovations developed by a complex set of actors, how can they be maintained? How can they be stable? How can they be successful? We look at um, one side effect or one element inter which interplays um, with Industry 4.0, which is agile management. So the idea of like, so we should have all projects look like software projects. What does this do to companies? This is what we're doing right now. And, um, and we do look at the social dynamics of change projects. So what's actually happening if companies say, we, wanna we, we are going to have a digitalization project. And, and uh, so far we can say more often than not, they have, before they start the project, they have no idea what they actually want to do. And so, so these projects become arena for all different kind of topics. So it's really um, opening up the ideas, uh, opening up a space for bringing in very different ideas how a company can change uh, besides digitalization. OK, so, so let me briefly talk about um, the dynamic of Industry 4.0 and, uh, and the future of work. So, so what we looked at is how does this narrative of like, like, like the quote I read to you became so important. And it was created by German industry associations. And they approached state organizations with that and said, this is something we really have to do. We have to work on this. And they subscribed to this idea. And then they started to addressing companies and also companies addressing other companies. So big companies telling their supplier, if you want to stay our supplier, you also have to, be, um, you have to start with this process of transforming into Industry 4.0. Labor unions got on board. Um, then they started to create new organizations which really, really are promoting this idea of an industry 4.0, the narrative. And of course, this is all covered by media. And, um, and I mean, I could go into details, but just to give you an idea how this, how this field emerged. So there's all kind of different actors working and talking with each other on this topic of industry 4.0. And a lot of activities are now framed by this. And, but the important point is, um, even if, this, if, if we have this organizational field with all these people involved and special organizations devoted to this, this doesn't mean a, conver a convergence of the idea what Industry 4.0 is. So far, we did roughly 200 interviews with companies and industry associations. And this is just some of the quotes what we always ask people, what is Industry 4.0, right? And this is just some of the quotes what people tell us. And this is just everything, right? From, um, constant cut contact with com uh, customers, work independent of space and time, like this, this communication between work pace and production. It's about competitiveness, about connection. It's about the digital twin. So you have a simulation of the machine running next to your machine. But also, it's just a different wrapping, right? It's a company who just sells the same product, but now calls it Industry 4.0, and they're really happy with it. So, so every or very different actors use it in very different ways. And it's, this is, would be our argument. It's so, so successful because it can cater to all these different perspectives and interests. And it's not a technical term. It's not a, a technical definition. And it works so well because it's not a technical definition. Um, so this is one, one of the areas we are working in. Um, the other one is the question of, um, of how work could look in the future. And it's also an example of, uh, I, I, I talk about this example because we want to give you an idea how we work. So there was this, um, this uh, the, the sort, sort of manifest by our, uh, the German Ministry of Labor on, it says here, work, Arbeiten, work 4.0. So they translated this industry 4.0 in the question of, I mean, nobody has an idea what work 3.0 is, but anyway. Um, so work 4.0. And what they suggested is collaborative forms of imagining work. And they call it praxis labor. So like, it's like a lab, but in a praxis situation. So it's not, not at a university, but it's located at companies. And we are, did, did this, and we are doing this, for example, with this one company. It's a, it's a large IT company, 100,000 employees, 
worldwide. 12,000 of these employees are in Germany. Complex structure. And they are, like, they are one of the promoters of digitalization, right? They, they would sell you all the big data solutions, all the artificial intelligence solution. Interesting enough, internally they mostly work with Excel. Um, <laughs> but, but so they're also struggling um, with, with their own digitalization efforts. So, so like what they sell you is something different they would use themselves. And um, they try to catch up whatever th that means. And they th ha try to th rethink how work could look like in this company. And this is what we're doing together with them in this Praxis Labor, uh, Practice Lab. Uh, on work, and um, so this, this was an idea by management, but uh, also um, the work council was already involved in producing this book for the ministry. So the world work council really liked the idea, and they started having really regular meetings between uh, work council, management, uh, labor unions, and us. So this is like the pictures you will see is, is from these meetings. And so, so what we will start soon is this test phase where they tell 200 employees work where you want and whenever you want. So this is just, they open up all the rules normally apply to workplace and work hours. And the idea is to generate ideas by people doing this. So it's not top management or somebody else sitting there and thinking what would be good solution, but like letting people come up with a new solution. And then, of course, evaluate this process um, during this one year, and then only after one year decide what actually makes sense of the ideas and solutions which, which happened there. So, um, so the idea is to identify po possible obstacles, uh, but also uh, solutions of how work can look like together. So all involved actors, and most importantly, the people who have to work this way in the future. So it's not decided for them. And also for us, of course, it's, uh, it's about understanding the transformation of, of companies in this context of Industry 4.0. So, so again, this is one of these projects which has these two sides. Um, so for the company, they develop new, new forms of work, but, but also, and this is probably even more important, they develop new forms of collaboration and ways to, to start change processes within the company. So this is a collaborative form also already within the company. They have never tried out this way beforehand. And for us, of course, we learn about how work could look like in the future. Um, we, we look at the changing requirements for work in the context of digitalization. Um, and we look at the internal dynamics of such transformation processes. So this is two examples. So the, uh, the an analysis of the narrative of Industry 4.0 and its impact and the Praxis Labor as examples of what we work and, and how, we, how we work. And now, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. Yeah, thank you. Now, a second example on social robotics done within my group, two PhD projects. One is on interfacing robot care. The other is called Robots Wanted, Dead, and or Alive. And Second and third, a shield exchange on techno society. I will walk you through these uh, things. Here we have a connection of PhD project plus a public event, which then feedbacks onto these projects. Okay, robotics and society. You know, there's always this, if you talk about social robotics or assistive robotics, whatever you might call it, <coughs> how do we engineer sociable robots that's one question. And how do we perceive the sociability of projects? Of course, we know that there are many projects already around, especially with psychologists and uh, ethicists and so on. But we try to go for something else on from a rather more sociological end of SDS. The first one is interfacing robot care. The question is, how are robotics and care interfaced? first of all, within the context of European innovation politics. And the hypothesis is it requires extensive work, both social and technical, to render robotics and care, robots and elderly people, compatible with one another. It's not just an evident thing that robot, robotics and care should go together that way, way robots and elderly people should 
go along that well. So we really try to find out how this is engineered in the practice. And uh, Benjamin Lipp, uh, the PhD student, went for, among many other studies he did, uh, this is one of it, went into a so-called living lab uh, where he tried, uh, observed uh, how user tests in, in this lab environment uh, actually happened. He did video assistant did ethnographies, he did interviews and for quite some time, actually for four weeks. And that was really interesting what he found out, uh, that it was not just robot for care, but rather something, the reverse happened. It was all about caring for robots. robots. The, the particular uh, lab he uh, um, uh, analyzed uh, was a particular environment in which interfaces between, re between robotics and elderly care were kind of prototyped. Of course, they were trying out what should happen. And what he find out, found out was, that uh, in order to uh, the make the interfacing uh, interesting and functional, roboticists need to install robot-friendly conditions in the lab. So you need to make the environment robot-friendly, not just human-friendly, but robot-friendly. So try to prevent dirt from getting into the apartment because immediately the robot will fall down. Users need to be trained excessively in order to you know, be able to interact with the robot. And of course, sensors need to be fixed, you know, to fix the position of the users and robots. You can't just talk from here, you have to talk from there or rather from there uh, at this pace or rather more loudly or more, no, not that loudly, whatever. So it was carefully staged all the time so that the robot did have an environment he could, or he, it could interact with, right? That was one thing, caring for robots was one strategy in the living lab to make the robot you know, be able to interact, or the you know, robot and the users able to interact with each other. The other strategy was kind of staging robots for care. Here, uh, the doctoral students observed some kind of theoret theoretical, theor not theoretical, but theatrical techniques in order to make that happen. <coughs> for instance, he saw all kinds of, uh, they made all kinds of promotional videos. One, for instance, that holds imaginaries about the supposed life world of the elderly people. So you make all these videos for elderly people so that, the, oh, that's the way I will be, no? acting out later, being an elderly person with a robot. So this is, try to create, actively create imaginations of how my life with a robot will look like later, right? Then you have all these kinds of narrative devices such as instructions and scenario descriptions. Users in the lab were stimulated to act as if robots were already part of their uh, everyday life. So try, to, try it out. It's kind of an experiment, an ongoing experiment. That's another way to stage a future life with robots. And finally, there was kind of backstage management, like stage management from the control room by remote controlling these otherwise autonomous robot or by breaking off interaction sequences when something went wrong. So they try to uh, re-steer it so that everything went well again. So these two strategies were pretty prominent when saying, ah, how do we engineer actually sociable robots? One, through caring for robots. Second, through staging robots for care. We need to get active imaginations how this will look like. Next question, and this is heavily discussed in the scene as well, how do we perceive the sociability of robots? And what we see, you know, there's always a mix whether they are non-agentic or agentic, whether robots are inanimate or are they animate. It's always a versus. And actually, wherever you look, throughout the whole life cycle of robotics, you see it in the human-robot interaction research, this debate, you have it in engineering practice, you have it in science communication, you have it in marketing, in PR, in media discourse, in political discourse. There's always this idea, are they animate or inanimate, and what uh, should we take care of here? Now you might say, well, this is notably in the media, in the public discourse, where we have this idea that robots are somehow agentic, somehow animate. So for instance, here in media discourse, you have all this discourse going on, uh, I robot, you unemployed, uh, robots taking over, so like kind of intentional no? taking over. 
uh, you have it in marketing, you have it in uh, political discourse, for instance, Pentagon work about Terminators begins defense campaign and all that. It looks like as if robots are coming over and you know, trying to take over. But this is not just public or political or marketing discourse. No, I'm afraid to say there's more. If you go to the human-robot interaction scene, and into research, into engineering, you have the very same. There's always this mixture of uh, um, these perceptions of agency and animacy. For instance, uh, you see, we have all these interviews with researchers and engineers. They say they were worried and felt sorry for the robot when it was in a danger of had gotten stuck. Romba seem, seems to sit somewhere between a pet and a home appliance. So there are always these different um, perceptions. In science communication, uh, you have it. You have it in engineering practice. Uh, so they, wherever you are, you have this mixture, this meandering between the human and non-human, man and machine, animate, inanimate. And maybe that's it. Hmm? Robots are communicated as human-like, as intentional entities not only in the media and in politics, but also in research and engineering. And it's ongoing wherever you look, whomever you ask, you have these oscillation. Yet I would say, or we would say, sociability of robots does not, not result from a misconception. Of course, we all know they are not humans. Everybody knows that. But it's important that it's a practice of a continuous and ubiquitous double reference. The double referencing is the point. So, so we make them sociable. Of course, we know they're hu not humans, but we could interact with them like we would with another human. So it needs to be double reference, kind of a split reference, as Paul Ricoeur would call it. So maybe that's the point, not in deciding get real, you know it's not a human, but rather say, OK, let's play around with it. This is the way we make it sociable. Now, uh, these two projects set out to uh, go for a public exchange on this various topics uh, on robot care. We actually went out into um, uh, an elderly's home uh, in Munich. Um, we had this over here was a, uh, a kind of a bigger room where we could uh, have three experts very briefly give an input to a public of say an audience of say 100 people coming from science, from engineering, patients, uh, professionals, um, and so on, and the ministry. And they gave brief, brief inputs from three different angles, from nursing science, from social robotics, from robo-philosophy. And they had only you know, eight to 10 minutes to propose their perspective on robot care. And one round of discussing it with, with each other, another five minutes, that was it. So thereafter, we went outside, and there we had four scenarios, very concrete scenarios of robot care, together with caregivers, academics, and citizens, and young professionals who tried to discuss what we really think. Uh, for instance, if you would need a robot for hygienic care. Many said, well, I rather would like to have a person here, really, a stranger, or rather like a robot. Then they came to think and discuss, and they discussed completely different, very concrete scenarios of how would you, would you lead your life uh, later on, or what would, you use, what would you like to use the robot for. And actually, it provoked new questions among the audiences, matters of concern, perspectives, in the end, we uh, discussed it out in the plenary. It was really interesting. And it was not just kind of awareness raising for those present, but also something which gave us a lot back because we got new research opportunities. There were people from ministries there that actually, oh, that's interesting, interesting way to put it. Maybe, you know, we could give you some offers to, um, for special kind of funding. We met with completely new colleagues from institutes we didn't know of before, so it really was a feedback and a feedback loop for us as well. Okay, so what are the lessons learned from both examples we gave you, Industry 4.0 and Social Robotics, at least in our view, grand challenges and all of these projects involved in those uh, arrangements call for joint action. 
social scientists, engineers, companies, and many other stakeholders are united in the task of shaping their social technical futures. And this calls, as we say, a collaborative action, including us, of course, and us meaning us, not just us, the MCTS, but because I think we do need um, all the expertise we can get because we are always, we are always far fewer, fewer than the others, engineers and scientists, there are so many of them in companies, but SDS people are not that many. So let's try to, um, to go for collaborative action. So just briefly, our mission at MCTS is research, it's teaching, it's public dialogue. We haven't talked about uh, teaching just briefly so that you know what uh, we have here. We try to provide a diversified teaching program because the idea that you know, society is one size fits all it seems not a good one. So we go for a study program that's very basic, BA level for every student at TUM principal. They can come and choose a pick. Then we have a so-called um, two master's program, one on science and technology studies, which is deliberately small. We have 20 to 25 students per cohort in order to you know, develop an SDS community at MCDS. Then we have a new master on uh, responsibility in science, engineering, and society, rather um, targeted at future professionals in STS you know, for you know, ministries, media, companies, wherever. Then we have a PhD program. Um, uh, and also, as you can see here, the MCTS plugins. This is to mean that we say, uh, for instance, data scientists, they don't want to have it all. They don't want to do a master. They maybe want to have a small certificate. So this is data science and society for data scientists or we have something for the life sciences or something else. So we really try to be specific and pack a small package of STS for particular audiences. This has one grand, um, um, it is really wonderful because you, you can address specific audiences. The downside is that you can't market it that well. Well, we have so many different, so many students because they don't come in, in the thousands, but rather in very many different smaller packages. But all in all, we do have 3,000 students per year by now, so it's really quite fascinating what we set up. Uh, okay, what next? That the final slide. Um, what we try to do uh, and to convince uh, the university management is that we should do a bit more on what is called responsible engineering. And this is the next thing we want to do. Um, of course, you're interested in this as well, so I don't need to say a lot about that. Again, we want to do it in teaching, in research, and in dialogue or public engagement. We have uh, what still has to be done is as yet, doing STS or STS-related things is, you just can choose it. It's not obligatory. And we thought that at least for excellent students, it should be made obligatory. Students in engineering and technology, and engineering and science, I mean. And this is actually something the university management is keen on. Yes, it should be part of kind of a do more, get more program. You have a master in a kind of an engineering program, and then you add up an STS extra semester. That's one idea we have. Uh, the next thing is, of course, in research. Let's go for kind of responsibi responsibility in, uh, incubators. If scientists and engineers would want to set up an interesting grant or project, they get an extra funds for meeting with us a year ahead or something in order to collaboratively set up and design the project, so co-design the project with you know, social and ethical and other aspects involved right in, into the design of the project. That's kind of one another year. And of course, we would like to go for larger um, dialogue things like you know, a kind of forum for technology and society. For you know, It should be something where people just go by. You know? As yet, people have to come to the university if citizens and other stakeholders they have to come to the university in order to see what's going on, uh, we just suggested that there might be something in the middle of the city 
just you, know, you go by and see, whoa, there's something interesting taking place at the university. There is a dialogue, there is a kind of an exhibition, or there is a co-design, collaboration, whatever going on. I just drop in. So that'll be nice. Uh, these are some things we think of, but of course there's more to come. So in uh, conclusion, what it's all about is sociable technologies for a technological society. And yet, of course, we agree uh, that innovation enriches our life, but again, it challenges it as well. And yet, as we have seen both in Industry 4.0 and uh, with us in robotics, it is not yet clear where the journey is going, neither for individuals, nor professionals, groups, industrial, political, or legal actors. Let's go together. Let's collaborate in framing and shaping the processes. And OK, I think for addressing grand challenges, this needs our joint efforts. And this is why we're looking forward to talking to you some more, hopefully. Uh, this is the beginning of a wonderful friendship. <laughs> and thank you very much for your attention and hospitality. Actually, so far, I must say, we didn't have that problem. People just you know, approached us, or we approached people, and said, somehow, you know, this is the wonderful thing about a big university around you. Hmm? Of course, there are many, many professors, many, many working groups, research groups. If only 10 of them approach us, we've got a lot to do, <laughs> see? And usually, only those approach us which do have an open mind anyway, so we didn't have the problem of saying no to any particular project yet, as yet, that may change, of course. Um, and then again, uh, maybe in terms of the prosthetics thing, you might want to give an example, or? I, mean, rather... <clears throat> I, I, mean, I could spend, mm -hmm. could have spent the whole talk on mm -hmm. um, failed projects, mm -hmm. or failed attempts on projects. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, and we had these meetings which started with like meeting with the whole board and then sitting there um, and said, so it's not between us, the hour cost 10,000 euros, so how do we justify that? Mm -hmm. So this was not the best start ever, for example. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and, and so, 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 so like collaboration with, the, the, so it's the other side, right? Yeah. So some collaborations mm -hmm. do not happen because we, we don't see how we could profit from this, mm -hmm. right? So it's, mm -hmm. if, they, if, if we have the feeling this mm -hmm. is, great for the company, mm. but yeah. so mm. we just, we, at yeah, some point yeah. we just stop. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. And, and it, I think it's a really, really interesting question if mm. there's, if I understood you correctly, mm. if there are topics we can't tackle because we would need to do them in collaboration, for example, yeah. With, yeah, exactly. with, okay. with, with companies. Mm. Um, so far it hasn't happened, so, mm. so we have, we have um, um, mm. I mean, I, I, I really focused on the, on the mm. industry topic, mm. but we have uh, only in my group two, mm. two topics on, on question of diversity and gender, mm -hmm. um, mm. and so far it's all totally fine. Yeah, yeah. So yes, uh, can you move your slide back to the one that you showed, uh, the 4.0, the, the, the origin of 4.0? The origin? The origin. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, yeah. they, they do orders by fax, right? Yeah. So, so they just, they couldn't be, fur and they are world leaders in what they do. So, so they, they couldn't care less because this is so far away from what they do. So, That's so, amazing so, in China, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so, and, and, and so it's, the, 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 the narrative talks about this revolution, right? But, but it, this is why we call this, like, um, this, this narrative, uh, and, and but the, the, the reality is way more or like about the empirical findings of the actual changes. Um, mm. is much more complex mm. and just to give you one example the impact we see mm. is not on like that, that smart mm. factories mm. pop up all mm. side, but it's, uh, it's um, um, mm. labor uh, politics have mm. increased right mm. so all kind of people actively I mean we are part of the process mm. with this practice level right mm. so, so all people start to think about how labor mm. should look like and mm. could look like and what we could do to, 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 to yeah, yeah. make, um, so, yeah. so there's a lot of progress on better work, so, mm -hmm. so it's a really normative progress, and yeah. it's all triggered by the industrial this, this mm -hmm. debate on mm -hmm. technology, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mm -hmm. have technology in its core. Just to be safe here, just in case, uh, the, these narratives are, as he said, powerful and part of the empirical huh? mm -hmm. uh, transition. So they're not beyond it. It's not just talk. Because now that everybody adheres to it in some way or the other, you know, it joins forces. It brings people you know, going on and instigates certain action. So it does something. It's not just talk. It's also action, right? It's part of the program. It's not talk here and action there, right? I think there was somebody with a question. Oh, sorry, sorry, that's you. <laughs> well, actually, I think it plays on uh, sort of what you've been talking about, mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, I get the sense that there's a lot of discussion about how mm -hmm. this is going to affect the uh, structure in the society, but mm -hmm. if you think somewhat a little bit broader, it's, mm -hmm. it has the potential to really throw a lot of people out of work. Yeah. You know, automatic cars, so you know, mm -hmm. no more taxis. So mm -hmm. what do you do with all the 50-year-old taxi drivers? Mm -hmm. And then what happens politically mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that become the basis for some sort of a uh, populist uh, mm -hmm. political uh, uh, development? And I don't really, you know, I, I don't see that mm -hmm. discussion in uh, the things that you present. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to start? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, one, I mean, just to reiterate, these, these three levels of, of the mm -hmm. narratives are all treated as equal, but you just have to be aware that these three different levels exist and only the narrative claims that they are all smart factories everywhere doesn't mean they are smart factories. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, th there's a, we haven't, um, we haven't done a project on these debates on how the future is going to look like, right? What, what, we, uh, what we see and what, what uh, colleagues of us work on is, is um, the, the initiatives shaping and what mm -hmm. you have is like these, these studies like from Trey Osborne, for example, which just claimed 47% of all jobs will be lost in, in, in the US. And this is, of course, I mean, this is something, I mean, they, they just, they have very weird ways of measuring, like, jobs and how you could substitute them by, by, by machines. Okay. Um, and the question is really, yeah. what do we want to substitute? What can we substitute? And, and what kind of new jobs emerge? Because what we can see in... I mean, like the, the, my, my favorite example is, 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 is Volkswagen, which is not mm. probably in the media for, for its uh, great um, mm. moral success in the past few years. But, but they, like in, in large part of the company, they, they, are, they are up to a level of automation of 98%, something like this. And they increased workforce in the last 10 years from, I think, 360,000 to 600,000 people. So automation doesn't mean getting rid of people. It can mean mm. all it can, mm. right? It, it, mm. the, the really intricate thing is this interplay between these different elements. Mm. New jobs emerging, mm. other jobs mm. disappearing. Mm. And I, would, mm. I, I claim that there's nobody has an idea mm. how this is going to look like. And this is, mm. I think, a really good area yeah. for, for yeah. collaborative projects. Mm. So to, yeah, yeah. to map the area and just decide where mm. we want to go as a society. Yeah. Because yeah. There, 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 there could be scenarios where a lot of people lose their, their jobs, mm. but um, there are also scenarios mm. where, where we just get off, rid of jobs nobody wants to do in the first place. Yeah. So, but it, it's a really a matter of political decisions, which of these yeah. Yeah. parties will take. Yeah, and for doing good social science, for instance, to differentiate between sectors and branches and reordering these organizational and industrial fields, they are reordering 
enormously you know, right now, the products and services, connecting and so on. So this changes and reshuffles options and alternative routes enormously. So now I think only recently studies come up which try to compare different branches and say that it's completely different when you go to mechanical areas or to other areas. And in mobile um, in mobility studies you find novel ideas for how, how to approach these. So both differentiate which is good social science, and to do it systematically. No? Systems of, well, not just look here, but look at systems of mobility. Of, <laughs> that helps a lot to get a bit more no? um, yeah, upgeclear to a discussion, a bit more sobered discussion, right? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah. I, I know there are a few more questions mm -hmm. out there, but I, I'm, I'm sure um, the speakers will be happy to okay. mm -hmm answer in a more face-to-face -face, uh, manner, but please thank me again. Thank you. Thank you.